Coming up on this week's show, how a PlayStation 1 evacuated an airport. Classic Sonic is back again. And we chat to Mark Lemmert about making new Apple II games. The Retro Hour podcast is brought to you each and every week with our amazing friends at Bitmap Books. Now, you need to check out their brand new King of Fighters, The Ultimate History Book. Pre-orders starting on May the 9th. It is the first officially licensed and fully endorsed book of its type, revealing the entire story behind the game with the help of SNK itself. So you can sign up for the pre-order alerts on their website right now and check out the rest of their retro gaming books at bitmapbooks.com. And with our friends at PCBWay.com, now they offer a fully featured custom PCB prototype service with low cost, fast turnaround quality boards and they do services like 3D printing, injection moulding and lots more and they're massive supporters of the retro community. Get an instant quote for your project right now at PCBWay.com. Hello and welcome to the Retro Hour podcast, episode number 324, your weekly dose of retro gaming and technology news with me, Dan Wood. Me, Ravi Abbott. And me, Joe Fox. And great to have you joining us for another packed show, taking you on a journey inside the world of classic video games, bringing you up to speed with all the goings on in the world of retro gaming and tech over the last week. And we will have an incredible guest in the second half of this week's show. And uh, Ravi, of course, on his travels across America, um, you're in a different place today than we're about to see you right now. I'm uh, currently in Brooklyn. I've just seen the Beastie Boys walking down the street. (laughs) Amazing. (laughs) Hip-hop legends. No, I'm in Brooklyn uh, because I'm reaching the end of my journey and I've decided to do a few final things in New York after VCF East, which we had this weekend. So I've got a bit of a croaky voice because there was a lot of partying, a lot of drinking with Amiga Bill. He actually lost his voice for the event, so... For the first two days, it was kind of like a silent Amiga Bill, which uh, <laughs> that, that concept's pretty crazy if people know what his streams are like. Amiga Bill silent. Oh, my God. <laughs> it was funny because we did our um, patrons hangout last night, and uh, you give us a little tour of VCF that was really interesting. For those that don't know VCF East, you were at, weren't you? It's like a massive retro computing conference it happens every year. There's two of them in America, actually, I think, isn't there? Yeah. Um, everyone was asking, Where, where's Amiga Bill? And uh what happened to his voice? And they're like, ah, he's been out partying with Ravi. That explains it. <laughs> well, it, it was really awesome. It, it was a great event. And it was held on this kind of military army base. And um, they had like different sections. So it was really spread out. But man, I, I got some really good stuff there. I got a Magnavox Odyssey 2, um, which I, I, think, I don't think I've ever seen one in the UK. I got that boxed and... I had to chuck all my clothes out my bag and, you know, prioritize, get the Magnum box in there. <laughs> amazing. But it was an amazing event. There was some really cool stuff that you're never going to see in uh, Europe or the UK. And, uh, you know, it, it was like any of these retro events. You just have people with lots of passion. Uh, passion. I had uh, lots of listeners come up and say hi, which was amazing. So it was really good fun. Um, Rebecca Berger was there as well. They also had... A lot of the Commodore team all, all around. And hopefully, like Dan said, we're going to run some of these uh, Commodore talks that they had. But yeah, I mean, it just sounds like you've had the best time um, in America. I know you've been doing lots of retro game shopping in New York as well. Um, buying games for Joe, mostly. For oh, I've been don't say pictures. that. What if my wife listens? <laughs> <laughs> I've been taking pictures and Joe's just like, my wife's going to kill me, but get it. Yeah, there was there was a couple um, which would have meant remortgaging the house, yep. <laughs> so I yeah. said no to them. But uh, re- you considered it. Though, I, did, moment, I, did, I did consider it. There was there was some really really interesting uh, Genesis games that you've been spotting, haven't you? And I said, oh, keep an eye out for a couple of these ones, thinking you wouldn't find them. And you're like, yep, got this one, got that one, get this one. I was like, your, wow. Your daughter doesn't need to go to university. Exactly. Yeah. Spend exactly. The she she doesn't games. need a roof over her head. <laughs> or food. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, Ravi's final week in America. She's so going to be back uh, back in the studio again next week, but um, hopefully we'll bring you some of those talks from uh, VCF East in future episodes of the show. Now, while Ravi's been on his travels, um, Joe and I have been, you know, keeping the show going here, doing interviews as well. And actually, we're going to be talking to someone on that really interesting this week we did an interview with a chap called um, Mark Lemmert now he's actually making new games for the Apple 2 yeah so he made a game about a year ago now called no- Nox Archaeist um, which is a really really interesting like RPG 
and it's like it's I say it a lot, but it's like one of these like mind blowing games that they have running on old systems. Do you know what I mean? Where mm. it just looks like pushes the boundaries of that system. It just looks like it shouldn't be running on it, and it's just a really really detailed in depth um, RPG, and it's got that real Dungeons and Dragons feel, which you know we always kind of come up in these kind of conversations with these kind of people. Um, but he's recently released a book, or he's writing a book, which is about essentially the making of the game as well and mm. you know because it was it was a big success and you know not only was it on the apple 2 you can play it on modern pcs as well it's on steam and so which is really cool and it, it was a good success so he's released this book all about you know the making of it as well and it's just it was it, a lot of it was over my head <laughs> i'm not gonna lie you know kind of <laughs> like getting things to run on the apple 2 and stuff like that but it was really really interesting and then really interesting to kind of like hear the history of the game and stuff and you know, if you're into like fantasy, you know, if you're really into your computers and really into fantasy, then this is right up your street. It was really interesting. I, I remember when it came out, there was like a lot of really high reaction from it because we've had so many guests on the podcast that have talked about the Apple II being their kind mm. of roots of gaming and their first entry. And um, even Steve Wozniak, you know, uh, the creator of the original Apple, praised this game. And, uh, you know, yeah. there's, there's yeah. a lot, lot of interest about it. It's a. Uh, really seems like a cool thing and uh i kind of love the idea of releasing a backstage book and looking behind what's going on well this game's had a really long journey i mean he originally kind of came up with the concept of it back in the late 90s mm. but it was something he couldn't make happen back then he kind of obviously moved on with his life rediscovered the apple II again in recent years actually finally got this game made but with the help of some you know really high profile people like Richard Garriott was involved in this and oh, giving wow. advice. And you mentioned Rebecca Heinemann, who was at VCFE. She helped with this too. And Steve Wozniak's endorsed it. So, I mean, it, you know, you couldn't really get a bigger list of uh, Apple II <laughs> legends, could you, to endorse your game. So it's really interesting chat, actually. And uh, we chat about, you know, when he used to run his own bulletin board system and ISP and all that kind of thing as well. So nice. really interesting chat with Mark Lemmer. He's coming up on the show in around half an hour from now. Now, before then, lots of news stories, as always, to get into. And uh, this was one that I think Joe messaged uh, <laughs> the minute the news dropped the other day. Is like, oh my God, new Sonic game coming up. We need to talk about this. It's actually a collection of remastered Sonic games with some uh, nice improvements as well. And this is a collection called Sonic Origins. Yeah, so I, I love it. It's it's new Sonic, it's new old Sonic kind of thing. Like, <laughs> again. Again, once again. Um, so yeah, Sonic Origins remaster of the original, I was going to say three games, but essentially five games. Um, so we're getting it on June 23rd, which is Sonic's official birthday. It will be his 31st birthday. He's getting on now. He's in his 30s. Yeah, he's yeah. Not, he you know, he's still young. Like he is still young. He hasn't 31. got the beer belly. <laughs> he's not got the beer belly. He's still, he's still <laughs> running, isn't he? So he's still got it. So this is the interesting thing. So we've got Sonic 1, 2, and 3 in this collection. Sonic and Knuckles. Sonic CD, which I think is fantastic. But it's also saying it's got Sonic 3 and Knuckles in there as well, which is what's getting me excited because obviously you guys know, I'm sure a lot of our listeners know, Sonic 3 and Sonic and Knuckles, they had the, well, Sonic and Knuckles had the lock on technology mm. where. You plugged if you plug Sonic Two into it, you could play Sonic Two as Knuckles, but it didn't change like the story or anything like that. It was just Knuckles on those levels. But then Sonic Three, if you put that into Sonic and Knuckles, you essentially got the full game. Like you know, I think there was there was additional levels. I can't remember the actual ins and outs of it, but you got essentially the whole of Sonic Three as Knuckles and the whole of Sonic and Knuckles, and there was loads more levels, and you got the real ending of the game and everything, and that that version isn't on any of the remasters. You know how we got them on like the Sega Saturn and the GameCube? And, yeah, so know. there was Sonic Jam, wasn't there? Which was a, yeah, yeah, kind of it, like a, a little filler, but it had extra features like yeah, Spin Dash and like, stuff like that. Yeah, none of those compilations had that Sonic 3 and Knuckles, whereas oh, this okay. version looks as though it does, which is really exciting to me. We, we actually um, spoke about it um, years and years and years ago on the show. We were talking about... Um, hacked sonic games and one of the hacks like you know like a rom you could play was a rom of that that version of the game where you got the full sonic 3 and knuckles experience so it's really cool that they're, they're bringing that to you know modern consoles so it's coming out on everything ps4 ps5 mm. xbox one xbox x and s switch steam everything's getting it epic games which is really really cool 23rd of june uh, but they've also added a lot of like like ravi just said a lot of quality of life kind of things into the game so They've upscaled all the graphics, so they look really nice. You know, the 
proc full remasters like um, Sonic Mania that we got in 2018, um, which is really cool. But you can also play, um, you can play it in the classic like 16 by nine, or you can play it in widescreen as well. That's which... I think that's so important because mm. like you know a lot of games when they go into widescreen, they're mm. very different. It's a different experience having that kind yeah. of you know old aspect ratio, but with yeah. with the improvements is is a yeah. real like look at detail you know yeah absolutely you know um and uh there's going to be there's all do different soundtracks in there and stuff as well but like you're going to be able to play it in the with the mega drive soundtrack as well which is really cool or you can have like the updated soundtrack and also you can actually play as sonic tails or knuckles in any of the games so if you want to play sonic one as knuckles or if you want to play him as tails you can do that if you want to play as tails and sonic and knuckles you can do that. You just switch between them, which I think is really awesome. That's cool. Yeah, and then my I think co- can... main question is: um, Can you go from fifty to sixty hertz? So like the soundtrack Ooh. speeding up a little bit. Oh, I don't know about that. I don't. That's a good question. <laughs> a, I European don't work for them. I sound like I work for them right now, but <laughs> um, I don't. I don't know about that one. Um, but you know, you're talking about the playable characters. There. I've seen a lot of people on Twitter unhappy that you can't play Amy though because she features in a lot of the cutscenes. Yeah, she's all over the artwork, and um, they've actually also. Um, I don't know where they're going with this, but they've they've done like a whole animation with it as well. And that's one of the things that's kind of been like as a selling point for the game, that there's a whole new like animation through the whole like game. So I'm assuming, mm. you know, throughout the game, there's going to be animated clips to kind of connect a story together, perhaps. Um, and Amy is in is in all these clips and she's in the story and stuff. So but like you say, you, you can't play as her. She's so I don't know if it's going to be a case of like they're going through the old games, they've gone back in time to save her or something like that. You know, that's just me speculating. But it's, mm. I wonder what comes with it as well because, like, I remember they had a was it Generations or it's the one? It was the one um, on the Switch, and they had like a, a drive with a ring and stuff that came in it. Here it <laughs> says a uh, digital deluxe edition it adds exclusive music and cosmetics. So. Yeah. Well, let, let me let me tell you one thing that I I've been seeing. This is the main criticism of this collection that I've seen, and people have been kind of ripping it on Twitter because of this. Now they've actually released a chart. There's like a spreadsheet. Yeah. That okay. details all the different kind of DLC you get yeah. with each different edition. Yeah. By the looks of it, there's like what five different editions. So the stand- and people, <laughs> the standard. Yeah, well, edition. Some people on Twitter are like, I, I missed the day that you could buy a video game and didn't need an Excel spreadsheet to figure yeah, out. Yeah, I know that it. that is great. The standard edition start dash pack. Premium fun pack, classic music pack, digital deluxe edition. Um, they've only at the moment standard edition and digital deluxe are the only ones actually available. And one's going to be thirty pounds, and one's going to be forty pounds, or I think it's like thirty five dollars and forty five dollars. But you are right; it is on like an Excel spreadsheet, and it even looks like one on the official like website. Um, but essentially, by the looks of things, you get like bonus coins, which are essentially uh, bonus rings, not coins. Sorry, that unlock content within the game so i imagine if you get the, the digital deluxe edition you can instantly unlock the likes of knuckles to play on any, any level i'm assuming mm. do you know what i mean you I can buy so, yeah you can buy that extra content and stuff like that um but one of the other criticisms i've seen is they're trying to say it's like the ultimate retro kind of sonic pack and people are a little bit like where's sonic spinball and mm. where is um knuckles chaotix the 32x game yeah, you know, hopefully they're in there as like unlockables or something, and um, that would be really, really cool. Um, but I feel like that would be a selling point if they were, you know, they'd announce that if they were on there as well. You know what, though, as well, I mean, the pricing of it is. I mean, I've bought these games mm-hmm. so many. I mean, probably every console mm-hmm. I've bought for the last twenty years. Oh yeah, has got you know at least Sonic <laughs> One and Two on there. Oh yeah, <laughs> and like. You know, if, if you're talking to me, like the, the best Sonic collection I probably own is the Mega Collection for the GameCube, mm-hmm. yeah. yeah. Um, which I, I think is like what 12, 13 games on that. That's like you know, loads yeah, you get all the Game Gear on ones and stuff on it, don't you? Yeah, which this is not as fully featured as that, and I do think it is kind of crazy that there's so many, like five different editions. That does seem a little bit overkill, um, and it retails for I think the standard edition is always thirty three pounds and forty dollars. Yeah. yeah, that's it. Yeah. Thirty seven pounds for the. The digital deluxe edition, which I mean, to me, does sound. I mean, I know these games have had a lot of love and treatment, and you've got stuff. If you get the deluxe edition, you get um, extra missions, exclusive yeah, music, you get cosmetics, an exclusive difficult mode or something on it. Yeah, yeah. but it feels it's like you're you, you paying mega fanboys, isn't it? Mm, it but you're put, paying like triple A price for games that I've bought so many times. To me, that is kind of it. Feels a bit. Oh, of a I think sell. you're out. Of the, you're out. You're, you're out of the. Uh, 
what's the word I'm looking for? You know, you're not with the kids now, mate. That's not AAA game prices. AAA game prices these days. Well, yeah, 80, like, <laughs> yeah. If, it was, if it was like another world, the definitive edition, you would just go for it straight away, wouldn't you? I'm, I'm going to buy this anyway. Come on, let's yeah. not kid ourselves. But you know, it's um, yeah. it, it does just feel a bit like seeing a price approaching 40 quid to buy Sonic 1 and 2 again. I'm I'm like, I've oh. bought yeah, Sonic but, CD but it's all so nice and it's all, re- it's, it's all remastered and nice, Dan. <laughs> Again, again, um, yeah, yeah, but I, it is cool to get a collection of them, and I think you know, it is nice that they've not just dumped them on there, you know, as downloadables mm, like yeah, happened yeah. so many previous systems. Getting those refresh visuals and stuff, I think, uh, it's obviously got a bit of love in there. So, uh, and particularly for people that haven't bought it, you know, two thousand times like I have, I imagine it's uh, probably more enticing. But um, yeah, if you're a Sonic fan, you want to play it on your modern console again, <laughs> and that comes out in June, and that uh, will link up the article and the trailer in our show notes at theretrohour dot com. Now, maybe you listen to this podcast each week, and as we do, because we've done so many episodes of this show, you're like, who was on episode? Have we had this guest on before? Did we cover this in the news? Wouldn't it be handy to have a database of the Retro Owl podcast that you could search of all our back episodes? Oh, yes. And uh, nothing's more handy than having it on a C64, which is uh, absolutely amazing. So there's a a, a listener, long-time listener and friend of the show, Hags Lab. And Patreon, I believe. And Patreon, yeah. Check him yeah. out on YouTube because he's actually going around and he's like developing a lot of C64 programs. He's showing you behind the scenes stuff, but he's actually gone off on his own. We didn't request this or anything. He's just like, I'm going to make an episode guide for the retro hour for the C64. And mm. this is absolutely insane. You know a lot more about C64 than me, don't you, Dan? So kind of let us know about this. Well, what do you, I mean, first of all, I'll link the video up, and it's around um, a 20-minute video. It kind of talks about the whole making of it and everything, too. Um, and there's also a link if you want to download it off his website. This is a Hags Lab on YouTube. And uh, what he's done, essentially, he's put all of our back episodes, he's took all the data off, all our show notes, and he's put it in a searchable database that you can load up on your original Commodore 64. And there's some really cool stuff in there, like he's uh, he's remade the Retro Hour logo in uh, <laughs> Petsky graphics yeah, so you know it's quite what, hard to do isn't it uh, pets i think that looks yeah that looks incredible how well he's done that i ever thought you know when, when i saw that i thought if we ever launch our own bulletin board we need to use <laughs> yes, that as like the intro logo yes, that's a plan um yeah but i mean he's everything's in here so you can go in it shows you the uh you know there's versions of the database that you can update you know as new episodes come out there's uh you can press the function keys on your keyboard find out about the show um find out about us guys as well you know stuff you stuck you, off our you website can s- select like a random episode as well yeah or you can uh search for them which is pretty awesome and it seems like he said he's written it in c uh using the uh, cc65 cross compiler and it's a which is prg like, file yeah that well prg files are like what you load on um you know sd cards for the commodore 64 okay. A lot of the games are kind of in, in that format. Uh, but yeah, for example, say you want to see when we had uh, LGR on the show, um, you just press F5 and then press on the search and you type in LGR and it shows you all the times that he's been wow. on the Retro Hour and which episodes you can, you know, episode lookup feature on there as well. So it's uh, just the fact that, like you said, you know, someone's actually took the time and effort to do this for our little show, I think, is just really humbling. And, uh, you know, it, just what an honour to have us guys on a Commodore 64, I think is cool. Yeah, it's 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 kind of like useless because you can't listen to the episodes and stuff. But it is the coolest thing ever. Yeah. It's like if you want to get like the ultimate old school experience, then yeah, check well, us out on uh, the C sixty four. I love in the comments he's put that he's put an Easter egg in this one, mm. like you know, oh, figure nice. out how to do it. And I, I'd love it if the Easter egg was just like a digitalized like eight bit version of Ravi just comes up on screen or something like with his thumbs up or something. Singing Hall of Fame. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, I mean if you want to no one's found the Easter eggers yet. Um at the time of recording this he only released this yesterday. So if you want to download the uh, Commodore 64 episode guide of the retro hour, I'll put a link to that in our show notes as well. And uh, first person to find the Easter egg is the best. How's that sound? Yeah, we are. I like so, that. It's the best. Yeah. Out, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll put that out. Shout out. And a massive thank you to uh, Hags Lab for making that just really, really cool, I think. 
Now, something else we're really hyped for as well, and uh, I know you're keeping a very keen eye on the developments of this, Joe. Uh, This is Turtles Shredder's Revenge, the brand new Turtles game that is coming out this summer. Uh, You know, obviously kind of in the style of the, the classic arcade games from back in the day. But the more we see about this, I don't know about you, the more excited I am yeah. to get my hands on this game. Yeah, man, this looks really cool. We've not spoke about this in a while, but we have we have spoke about it. So it's interesting because we're getting two Turtles games this year. So we're getting yeah. this one, Shredder's Revenge, which is essentially the, the sequel to the beat-em-ups, you know, that from the early 90s, late 80s, you know, the, the, from Turtles, the arcade game, Hyperstone Heist, um, Turtles in Time. It's kind of the sequel to them, which is really, really cool. And then there's also the Konami Kawabunga collection, which is a remaster yeah. of all the originals coming out as well. So um, we, we're at, this is actually coming from um, the publisher .mu, uh, who we've had those guys on before because they did the Streets of Rage 4 uh, game as well. Yeah, they, you know. they're on it, aren't they? They really need to get them back on the show. We do need to get them back on the show to talk about this. But what I really love about this, and this is why it's in the news this week, is they've actually got the original cast of characters to voice to voice the characters, oh, um, nice. which I think is really cool. So, um, unfortunately, not all of them are with us anymore. Um, a couple mm. of them have passed away. It, 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 at the end of the day, it's a 35-year-old TV show. And, uh, but Don't make me feel old. I know, I know, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we well, are getting the original Turtles voice cast. So we're getting Cam Clark as Leonardo, Townsend Coleman as Michelangelo, Barry Gordon as Donatello, and Rob Paulson as Raphael. So the original Turtles are back, which I think is really, really awesome well, that yeah. they've managed to do that because they're not the biggest studio, um, dot MU, but I think that's so awesome that they've managed to do that and they've got the rights for it because of, you know, I don't know how the development of this one's happened, but with the Streets of Rage one, they just kind of ask Sega, can we do this? And, you know, mm. they got the okay. So I imagine a similar kind of situation with, with uh, you know, Shredder's, Shredder's Revenge has happened, but... We, you remember in the original games, you got a lot of the um, just kind of small sound bites, didn't yeah. you, of the, of, of the characters in there, which is similar. I mean, there's a there's actually like a, a trailer you can watch, mm. 11 minutes of gameplay yeah. that I put in our show notes as well. Um, and this looks incredible. Now, I'm going to play you just a little clip, and you can hear it's kind of very much in the vein of the original. Listen to the music and listen to just the character sound drops that are in here. This is going to take you back 30 years. You know, I could it, be uh, in an arcade in 1990 yeah. hearing that. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, you know, I wasn't I wasn't that familiar with the arcade, but I was with the TV show. So, like, seeing, like, Rocksteady mm. and Bebop and kind of, you know, like, those characters. And <laughs> I'm just like, wow, this is cool. So, so kind of maybe people who haven't been into the arcade that much but did experience, like, you know, Turtle Mania back in the days. Yeah, this, is, this looks like a good addition. I must say April O'Neil's hair looks huge. <laughs> the 80s hair ravi you, you know you know what i would have really some hairspray or something you know what i would have loved um if they did what they did with streets of rage where they set it you know 30 years later so the yeah. characters were all like you know they're all in like their 50s and stuff in streets of rage and then there's like a few younger characters you can play as i think it would have been quite funny if they did the whole you know teenage mutant well it wouldn't be teenage it'd be like middle-aged mutant ninja turtles <laughs> yeah, 45 year old turtles. yeah. I, I think that would have been funny but it obviously it does look it's set like immediately after you know the original kind yeah. of turtles and stuff which is really cool um, timeless really isn't it yeah this, uh, so yeah and it, it transports you back i mean it feels like a you know turn of the 90s kind of game mm-hmm. the soundtrack and everything as mm-hmm. well and the gameplay i mean i was a huge fan of the original arcade. I mean, the, God, the amount of summer holidays we'd go to the seaside and <laughs> my brother and I just, you know, pound my dad's money into that machine. You know, it was just, and the fact that it was four players as well. Yeah. You could get all your mates on it. It was such a good game. Oh, so, yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, I'm really, really hyped for this. So um, as we get closer to release, I'm sure we'll hear more details and uh, yeah, we'll try and get the guys back on to uh, tell us a bit more about the development of it as well. That'd be interesting, I think. Now, lots of other news stories to get through. We need to talk about the Vectrex Mini and how the PlayStation 1 Force the evacuation of an airport in just a minute. Before we do that, though, let's take a little pause to give a big thank you to our incredible supporters. Now, these are the people who are the lifeblood of the Retro Hour podcast. These are our fabulous patrons. Oh, God, 100%. And, you know, I don't want to get too deep because I say this every time I end up talking about the patrons, but it is so true. Bottom line is the truth is if it wasn't for our patrons, 
the show wouldn't be here anymore with everything that happened over the last kind of two years and stuff like that. So mm. we are forever thankful and grateful for it. And uh, becoming a patron, you get you get like a load of bonuses. We're actually about to record the Retro Hours After Hours. And uh, that's a podcast where we've got, how many episodes is it now, Dan? 22, I think we have in the bag. It's like Ooh, two geez. years worth. <laughs> Two years worth of episodes. So if you become a patron, you can get exclusive access to our RSS feed and straight away all those episodes appear. And um, yep. also you get the podcast early, ad-free as well. And uh, this this week we're going to be talking about um, 2005. Yeah, we're going to be going back on there uh, because we do this on the, the After Hours podcast um, which is for our goal members and above. We do it every single month, a full podcast just for our patrons. And uh, kind of alternate episodes we do, um, kind of reminiscing on a certain year in gaming. So we thought we'd do 2005. I mean, God, what a year. You know, the the launch of the, the 360 came out in that year, Xbox mm-hmm. 360. Um, we also got the announcement of the, the Wii, or uh, Project Revolution, I think it was called, when it was announced at um, E3 in 2005. The PlayStation 3 as well was announced there. So it was on that cusp of going from you know the, the PS2, uh, original Xbox, into the next generation. So a really exciting time for gaming and technology as well. So um, I'm looking forward to that. So now is a very good time to join us on Patreon because um, this weekend you'll get access to that. And also we do our patrons hangout as well. I mean, in the most recent one, Ravi gave us a little tour of VCF that was really cool, actually. Uh, and and you can join us for the one that's coming up in a few weeks' time. We'd love to see you on the May Patrons Hangout. So really, the main reason that we have a patron, though, is just to make sure that we can cover the running cost of doing the show for you each and every week. So where it really does make a massive difference to us. And of course, for backing us on Patreon, you will get a mention in the most prestigious high score table in the world of retro gaming. And that is... Hall of Fame! <laughs> the Retro Hour Hall of Fame. Just that one new patron to give a massive shout out to this week. Big thank you, Giles Jones, for supporting us on Patreon. We hugely appreciate it. And if you'd like to join him and also get a mention just after Ravi's beautiful singing in the Hall of Fame, you can join us right now at theretrohour.com. That sounds epic, that, doesn't it, don't you think? It's, it's the only time my singing's <laughs> been repeated. I remember, I remember <laughs> singing in church and uh, the rose would clear around me <laughs> as people tried to escape. <laughs> Well, I haven't checked the listener stats for the last couple of weeks. If everyone turns off around this time <laughs> during the show, dip. then I uh, yeah. might have to knock that on the head. Yeah, but uh, yeah, thanks so much, Charles. Right then, we're going to talk about the uh, the PlayStation evacuating uh, an airport in a minute. Before we do, though, you must have been excited about this news, Ravi. I know the Vectrex is kind of your dream system. You still haven't got your hands on one, even though you've been saying you will for like, what, seven, eight years now. But this could be one that's achievable for you. A Vectrex Mini. It seems like it would be more fun. Um I haven't got Vectrex because they're a nightmare to repair. They're um, hard to maintain and uh, you've got a huge kind of CRT in there and stuff. And and it's older than me. So having something on like new hardware is really good. And we've seen a lot of these kind of little minis be created and, uh, you know, people doing them at home. And this one seems really impressive. So it's done with a Arduino Pro micro board. Um, that's being used for the joystick and it's got a little separate joystick unit as you have in the Vectrex. Now I think the joystick is probably the most impressive part of this. So I've seen Vectrex emulators before, but um, he's fully like recreated the joystick and got it running on a controller. And those things are quite rare from what I've seen. I love the fact as well that he's kind of, because I mean, the Vectrex was very unique, wasn't it? Um, yeah. There's only 28 games on the system, but the fact that it used those vector graphics, you know, there's nothing else really like it from that era that I've played before. So in terms of, um, you know, a unique console experience, and something that I imagine will probably be quite difficult to emulate, um, but they're saying in this article here that apparently, you know, modern LCDs can perform well enough to emulate the effect. And obviously the original Vectrex was monochrome, so you've got these yeah. kind of colour overlays, but actually he's emulated the colour overlays on this little uh, mini as well, which is pretty cool. Yeah, I've I've had an emulator previously for my Wii U, which was an actual Vectrex one, which is pretty crazy. But um, he's he's even using a Raspberry Pi Model B as well. Uh, it's a two, so you know it doesn't require that much power to be honest to run it. But it's it's in a real nice little form factor. I've always thought um maybe he could have used a, a screen from a mini oscilloscope. And gone <laughs> pretty <laughs> hardcore, but yeah, this is this is pretty impressive, and uh, it's it's absolutely tiny. It's got this like little two point five inch LCD on there. 
you know, Vectrex games as well, they're all kind of portrait, weren't they? Because the screen yeah, is upright, yeah, so it's brilliant, um, which gives yeah. them a unique, yeah, a unique way of playing them. And uh, I thought it's a system again. I mean, I know we've done episodes about it before. I, I'm the same as you, Ravi. I've kind of looked at them and I've I've seen ones on eBay that I mean the price is going up all the time, but I've seen some that are kind of you know uh, non-working or needs repair, and they're kind of selling yeah. them for like a hundred quid. And I'm like, oh shit! I'm like, oh my god, way beyond my technical skills. Um, building something like this is also way beyond my technical skills. Just getting that out yeah, there. Yeah, I, I, think, I uh, was just <laughs> looking, really cool. just looking at the controller part. Like the other ones is just a screen put in a like 3d case which a lot of people do but he's also done the software side but the controller part he's done a custom case for the p- controller he's done a custom board and like that is majorly impressive and um yeah i do, and i love how the controller's mini as well it's 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 a really nice idea and if you want to see how small it is, it's actually a banana for scale in the uh, the thumbnail too. So it's on a, a YouTube channel called uh, Retro Game On. A chap called Brendan who's made this and uh, looks really good. And again, I mean, it just blows me away, kind of how you know ingenious some of these kind of fan projects are. That looks awesome. So if you want to check that out, that video will be in the show. It doesn't seem to sorry, it doesn't seem to have any batteries in there. But I guess you could probably run it off like a separate battery pack um, because it's micro USB powered, like just a Raspberry Pi, really. Yeah, get him like maybe a, a hardcore phone charge pack or something. Could yeah, run yeah, that, which something would be, which external would be like that. Yeah. So maybe something to take on the plane, Ravi, on the way back. Um, <laughs> yeah. Something not to take to the airport, though. Uh, a PlayStation 1. Because apparently a PS1 has forced the evacuation of Boston's Logan International Airport. How has this happened then? So this happened earlier this week, only a couple of days ago. Um, essentially a passenger was going through security and the x-ray machine uh they had a a playstation in their bag and it went through the x-ray machine and apparently um the suspicious item warranted them enough suspicion to call in the bonds bomb squad to dispose of the item um now some reports are saying it was just it just says it's a playstation so they don't know whether it's a ps2 ps3 ps4 ps5 um but then some reports are saying it was a PlayStation 1. It was an original PlayStation, not the PS1, the little one, the original PlayStation. So but apparently, this must have been in hand luggage. Then, so it was in I hand guess. luggage. Yeah, so it was yeah, in the person's yeah. hand luggage. Carry um, on. But apparently the reason it was suspicious and it set off like the warnings on the x-ray machine was it was in a degraded state. Apparently it was like rotting away and there was particles <laughs> in the x-ray machine which seemed suspicious from the wow. so that so that says to me it was an original playstation um which is obviously like i don't know rusting away you know some of the components might be rusting away in it or something but yeah. that begs the question why does this guy have it in his hand luggage you know has, has he is he is he was it you ravi have you been buying it, like no, no. retro <laughs> systems and putting them in your hand luggage while you what, on your I've, travels i've I've been doing 25 hours of flying and the TSA are pretty hardcore. This yeah. is my tip. Don't wear a button-up fly to America or you're going to get that area <laughs> inspected quite a lot. <laughs> and they need witnesses and stuff. Yeah. yeah. Don't you have a PlayStation 1 down your trousers either? But, I yeah, actually, just... um, I transported a Dragon 32 to America and I'm taking back a Magnavox Odyssey and the the key to transporting these things is have the original box. If mm. you've got the original box, they can see what it is and they know what it is straight away. And they're like, cool, retro. But if you've got like wires and <laughs> weird shapes and stuff like that, yeah. And especially if you've got it on your carry on, I think that's a bit a bit crazy just carrying on a, a degraded old console. A degraded old console. Well, it, apparently, you know, the spokesperson for the airports explained it was it was in poor condition as well. Um, and because of the condition of it, it, it raised concerns. So I, I, I maybe they knew it was a PlayStation, but it looked like it had been ripped apart and something mm, put in it. Saying, maybe. Uh, a lot of travellers were heading to PAX East as well, uh, which is mm. a gaming convention and trade show. So yeah. maybe he was he was on there to to sell it or maybe restore it or get yeah, it, get it actually it's... repaired. You know? Yeah, maybe, maybe. Or it could just be miscommunication and it was like a PS4 or PS5 and he was taking it with him to play, you know, while he was 
in his hotel room wherever he got to or whatever. So yeah, I think I think that's funny crazy situation. though calling the bomb squad though. I think that's Yeah. Crazy. Well you've got to be <laughs> there's a, these days, there's a rusty you, PlayStation so. over there. We need to dispose of it. Yeah, so I mean, that's the thing that a lot of these old consoles, I mean, particularly like, you know, if you get capacitor leak and all that kind of thing, I imagine like, you know, acids are leaking yeah. out of it and that kind of stuff. And, I, and so. I assume now you've said that, that is probably the abnormal, the abnormal I'll say it. Abnormality. Abnorm- maybe, maybe it was chipped as well. That might have um, caused some issue with <laughs> yeah. that. Yeah. Bad chipping job, yeah. Got done for piracy, um, yeah. flying on a plane, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so just a little warning if you are doing some travelling with your retro systems this summer, you might want to put them in the, uh, in the hold, not in your hand luggage, just saying. Or at least have a box or a manual. Now, we're going to be chatting to our special guest, Mark Lemmer, in just a moment, talking about making new Apple II games. Before we do that, just a moment to give a massive thank you to this week's sponsor, and that is our wonderful friends at Harry's. Now, you might know about Harry's. We've talked about them a lot on the show. We're big fans of Harry's, but they're actually more than just a super sharp razor company. In fact, Harry's want to revamp your entire routine, from close shaves to flake-free hair, all the way to clear, healthy skin, Harry's is on a mission to help guys feel good. Now, obviously, we're all kind of travelling at the moment. If you've maybe seen uh, pictures of Ravi, you're thinking, God, his skin's looking nice at the moment. Or maybe you saw Joe at the Doncaster Gaming Market thinking, Joe's looking fresh. That's all thanks to Harry's, isn't it, guys? It is, absolutely. Yeah. I, I, like, I like that as well. That was a good angle there. I didn't know you were gonna... We are good looking, and it is thanks to Harry's. <laughs> <laughs> and modesty. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but we want you, if you are going away this summer, maybe you're off on holiday soon, we want to give you a free travel-sized shower gel with a trial set and try out the other products as well as a shave as well. So in their trial set, you get an expertly engineered weighted handle. You get their five-blade cartridge that's actually made by artisans in their own German factory, complete with a precision trimmer. You get the handy foaming shave gel for effective lubrication, a travel blade cover for your adventures this summer, and a free shower gel just for retro hour listeners as well and obviously if you take up these offers you're really helping out the podcast as well so show our sponsors a bit of love and uh, take up this offer all you've got to do to get your shower shave and go kit is that redeem your free harry's trial set right now by covering the three pound 95 delivery and using our exclusive link so that's harrys.com slash retro harrys.com slash retro to get your set delivered and start your shave plan and your freebie will be added at checkout and a massive thank you to our friends at harry's for their continued support of our show right next i'm going to be talking about making uh, new rpg games for the apple II with our special guest mark lemon he's next on the retro hour podcast You're listening to the Retro Hour Podcast, and it is time for the main event when we welcome on our very special guest. And I must admit, I'm very excited to uh, to learn something from the interview this week because the Apple II is such a legendary machine, particularly with developers who come on the podcast from the US, and it was a huge machine there, and at role-playing games as well, obviously a massive genre. So today we're going to be joined by Mark Lemmert talking about this uh, incredible new game, a role-playing game for the Apple II, and a publisher of a book on the subject as well. Uh, the game is called... Nox Archeist, so we'll find out more about that soon. But let's welcome Mark onto the show. How are you doing, Mark? I'm doing great, thanks. How are you guys doing? Yeah, very good, thank you. And uh, really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us. Um, like I said, it looks you know, fascinating that a new Apple II RPG game is out. So I look forward to you know, learning a bit about the development of that. But it's always kind of nice to you know, find out our, our guests' geek credentials, if you like, and kind of go back to day one. I mean, what was it that originally got you into video games? And do you remember your first ever gaming experience? Uh, yeah, uh, boy, I was like five years old, and and uh, I'm dating myself here, but this is going to be the early 1980s. And uh, my family bought a Apple II Plus computer, uh, top of the line at the time. You know, it was not retro yeah. at all, cutting edge. Uh, and 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 I and I remember, you know, my dad and uh, brothers. My brothers are quite a bit older than me, and they were setting it up in the living room and. Uh, I, I have a, a just kind of a vague memory of uh, I think uh, there was a game called Parachute that that uh, my brother started playing and I was kind of anxious to you know join in and 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 then I later remember you know that these are just little snippets of memories but you know I think the next one uh, in, in 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 sequence is I can remember my brother's playing Ultima three and mm-hmm. you know watching that and I didn't uh, you know understand the game other than it had something to do with wizards and warriors and 
you know, this is the time when the Dungeons and Dragons cartoon was on in Saturday mornings, and uh, which I loved. And so I, I was just enamored with this game, uh, Ultima 3. And, uh, you know, I, I would say I was pretty much hooked from that point uh, forward on both uh, video games, particularly role playing games and, uh, and, and Ultima, even in more particular uh, within that genre. And what's so special about the Apple II for you? Is it, you know, because it was your first home computer or, you know, was there something about it that just stuck with you over these years? I, I think a lot of it was that it was the computer I grew up on. You know, I worked on, uh, on uh, played games and learned to program on that computer for easily 10 years before uh, my family got uh, the, the next computer, uh, a uh, 386 IBM compatible PC. Uh, my, my dad decided to go that direction rather than get a Macintosh. Basically, he was, he was upset that, uh, because, uh, Apple, when Apple made, released the Mac, they didn't make uh, it backwards compatible with the Apple II. And so all the software that, uh, you know, he had paid money for some of it, I should say, but that he paid money for, <laughs> you know, this is the golden age, this is the golden age of piracy, mind you. Mm, uh, yeah. but, but, but he certainly uh, paid a lot of money for some productivity programs and things and just never, really forgave Apple for that. So so instead of the Mac went the direction of the IBM PC. But getting back to your question, so that was a good solid 10 years that I was immersed in the Apple II computer, which is just like an eternity, you know, these days uh, to, to have the same computer. So there's certainly a lot of nostalgia, you know, for the games, you know, that I was playing then in those formative years, as well as learning the program on that platform and, and the desire to make my own game, you know, as I was learning to program, I was basically trying to make my own games. That's how I was learning, uh, you know, for the most part. And, and, and I never finished anything because I, you know, as I learned more programming, it was like, oh, I could do this much better. So I would just start over and, you know, apply the new things that I learned. Uh, it was a really great process for learning programming. Not so great for actually finishing anything, but, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a discipline that would come later. Well, you know, you mentioned that you started programming on the machine. I mean, were you doing that from the, you know, the manual that came with it, which I know was quite comprehensive on the, the Apple II, or were you buying magazines? How did you kind of pick it up? Yeah, well, there there was one book in particular, I actually have it on my desk right here, called the Apple II User's Guide. And this, I have the original copy that, that, that my dad uh, got back in the day. And boy, this thing is almost wearing out because <laughs> I used it a lot. And, and I, I honestly don't remember if this came with the computer or if he bought it separately, uh, but it was a very comprehensive book on uh, the kind of the machine in general. And, and then uh, it went in detail on like Applesoft basic programming. That, that was really the main book. Uh, there were a couple other books that I remember, you know, being in the house uh, at, at one point. And, and my dad had a subscription to a couple different computer magazines. Nibble was, uh, was one of them. And so, yeah, definitely. You know, I would read the columns and the, you know, the magazines like Nibble and, uh, you know, type in the sample programs they gave and learn things that way or learn tips and tricks and things that were sometimes put in those magazines. Uh, it, it was definitely a very self-taught process. So you mentioned that obviously you were playing Ultima and you saw your brothers playing it and all you knew about it is it had wizards and warriors and stuff like that in it. Were you a fan of fantasy books or D&D? Oh yeah, uh, absolutely, and uh, you know a, a lot, a lot of a lot of my my interest got kind of channeled through my brothers because they were older, and I would see them doing things, and you know they would you know have friends over and play Dungeons and Dragons, and you know I I I don't I, I don't really recall actually being a full fledged player in any of their games. I was more just the annoying little brother hanging around the table, but mm. picking picking it up through uh, osmosis and. Uh, and, and then I, I absolutely got into the Lord of the Rings books and uh, was reading those at the time and then eventually Dragonlance. And so to me, when I, when I saw, uh, Ultima three, it was just, it, it was a, the computer piece of that broader fantasy world that I was getting immersed in from those other, you know, media forms. Um, so yeah, it, it just fit like a glove for me. Yeah, and I think, you know, we've had like Richard Garriott and Rebecca Heineman on the show before. And, that, you know, I think everyone we talk to that's kind of involved, you know, particularly in role-playing games, they always say that D&D is like the foundation of it, really. I think yeah. you know, that's where it all started, didn't it, really, before it went onto screens? Yeah, it, that's exactly it. And and uh, I, I've talked to Richard a uh, number of occasions, and I and I can remember him you know, specifically saying that, uh, you, you know, when, when he was writing, even before Ultimate, even, even before Calabeth, when, when he was in school, writing 
the uh, the programs like on the, the card readers uh, that he would mm. call D&D 1, D&D 2, up to I think it was D&D 28 that became a Calabeth, you know, you know, said that you know, that is literally what he was trying to do was to recreate the D&D experiences that he was having, you know, in his living room on a computing platform. And so, yeah, that, that was that was the holy grail for sure. Well, obviously, those games, I mean, RPGs, you know, one of the most complex genres of video games that you could program, particularly, you know, if you're doing it on your own. I mean, did he make any kind of simple games in Apple Basic at first? Because I know a lot of people start with like a, you know, Space Invaders clone or something like that. I mean, what kind of games were you trying to make at the beginning? I, I for the most part, was trying to make a, a, an Ultima inspired, you know, tile based uh, graphical RPG style game. That, that, that was mostly where my focus was. And as a kid, when I was doing this, I, I, I was not, I, I, I was not making a lot of, I was making a lot of progress in learning programming, but as far as like the results on the screen were nowhere close. And I knew that. And mm. I was frustrated by that, you know, and, and so I would at, at times, cause it's like, well, you know, I would, did really want to actually finish a game. There were times that I would kind of dabble off in different directions and, uh, like, oh, well, I mean, I'll try making an arcade game. Maybe that'll be easier or, you know, uh, try making more of like a King's Quest style adventure game, uh, you know, with kind of focus more on uh, portrait screens of graphics. And, you know, so there are some times that I would kind of go off in different directions. But ultimately, all of these directions had their own challenges, which really rooted uh, in, you know, the the limits of of the machine. You know, the, the Apple II is a one megahertz processor. And the, uh, the, the, the machine that had the most RAM was, uh, 128K. The, the, of, of the 8 bit machine, Apple IIs, I should say, it was, uh, 128K was the max. So just microscopic amounts of resources. And so, yeah. so really, uh, what, what I eventually came to learn as I was doing all this as a kid was that the commercial, large commercial games at that time were all made in assembly language. That's what you had to do. In order to get the efficiency that you needed, both in terms of uh, CPU and memory, uh, and even disk space, uh, to, to be able to 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 make a game like that, and uh, and oftentimes even um, you know running right on the bare metal, there was not enough room on these eight bit platforms to even fit an operating system in memory and the game engine. Uh, it just you no know, was out of the question. You you had to kick the operating system out of memory and basically. You know, write write some machine language code to to bootstrap the computer uh, off of uh, the point where the ROM turns over control. You know, the ROM can basically get the computer turned on, and then it expects other code to take over. And if you don't have an operating system, you got to write your own bootstrap code uh, to basically chunk pieces of the game engine gradually into memory, and then and then do everything yourself because you've got no operating system supporting you with anything. Uh, and that was pretty typical. You know, that, that, that was something that, you know, that was, that was, that was like magic to me, you know, at that point as a kid, you know, working at Apple Basic. And like I said, I had some sense of how it was being done in the commercial games, but, uh, I was really never as a kid able to figure out 6502 assembly language. 6502 is the processor in the Apple II. A lot of it came down to just, uh, you know, the, there were no classes. Uh, there weren't even, uh, it was, it, there were even really any good books that I had access to. I, I remember finding one book on 6502 assembly language that was basically positioned at the intermediate level. And I tried reading it and I kind of understood a little bit of it, but I couldn't actually figure out how to actually write an assembly language program in the Apple II because I was missing a couple foundational uh, concepts about the environment. You, you know, you have to get into the right environment. Uh, in order to uh, to write that kind of code, and you need some specialized yeah. software called an assembler, and you know stuff like that that I just had no concept of at the time because you know I was learning programming uh, from the ground up, and uh, and in an intermediate book doesn't you know like tell you that stuff. It assumes you already know that stuff, <laughs> and you know just starts you know hitting you with other information. So I was never able to really break through into the assembly language world. Uh, as a kid, and as and, and as a result, you know, was never able to write the kind of game uh, that I wanted to make. What I was able to do, though, is figure out the logic of how a tile graphics engine l- worked. You know, because I, I spent countless hours playing Ultima. Uh, uh, three, four, and five were the Ultimas uh, that were uh, 
originally released on the Apple II and then ported other platforms. As of Ultima 6, the primary platform became the uh, the IBM compatible PC. But uh, I spent countless hours playing those early Ultimas and both having fun playing them for games, but then also, you know, I was always thinking about the logic of what was going on. And, and I eventually, in my head, pieced together the logic of how to write a game engine that would have uh, you, these unique graphical tile shapes uh, stored somewhere and uh, be able to basically draw them in any position on the, uh, on, on the grid, a tile grid on the screen and, and have, a, have a map that contained codes that represent those tiles that would sort of get read by the program that then calls the routines to draw the shapes. And I just started piecing this together in my mind of how to write a dynamic engine to be able to uh, to do that. And it didn't work uh, because there wasn't enough memory reserved for AppleSoft. The program was too big. Uh, you know, and I basically just kind of got a beep syntax error, overflow error, or something like that. And 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 I so I didn't really get to find out uh, if the logic worked. But then uh, after my dad bought the uh, that 386 IBM compatible PC, I took another crack at it, and and this time having you know this was like a 33 megahertz, uh, four mega RAM you know system, you know <laughs> hugely more capacity than the Apple II, and I, I got out you know I got a book on Microsoft uh, Q Basic, which seemed to be the main basic of the platform, and uh, you know it wasn't that much different than AppleSoft dove in, and I and I and I wrote this. Uh, this uh, game engine that I had in my head for a tile graphics engine again, with this time throwing, you know, basically brute forcing uh, the issue on the resource side and found that it worked. The logic fundamentally worked. And, and I had a map on the screen like Ultima uh, that would move, that would scroll, I should say, as you press the movement keys. Uh, it still rendered too slow, even with mm. the extra horsepower of the uh, the 386 versus the Apple II, it was still too slow for an actual you know gaming experience, um, and and ultimately the reason was that you know basic basic is just so inefficient compared to assembly language that yeah you know, this became a, this really drilled at home for me seeing uh, a basically a 386 three three thirty three megahertz PC get spanked by a one megahertz Apple II. Uh, running assembly language was like, okay, wow, I really get how powerful uh, assembly is now when you get that close to the metal. So obviously you mentioned there wasn't really any education, any of that, and it was all very self-taught and stuff. Was there any sort of user groups in your area back in the day or, you know, any other friends who were into programming on the Apple II? Uh, there were no user groups or at least none that I was aware of. Mm. Certainly, you know, I, I had kind of a circle of friends that, uh, you know, were into computers and games and things like that. Uh, but I, I, I really was uh, the most knowledgeable of the group when it came to programming. It's so that, uh, uh, you know, I, I tended to, 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 to get questions and answer them. And I didn't but I, I didn't really have anyone to, uh, you know, to go to that knew more than I did. Uh, the closest to that was, you know, as I was talking to my dad about some of these things and trying to uh, figure out, well, you know, how to, to, to learn assembly language and some of this more advanced stuff. I, I, I do recall that, you know, well, he suggested some people that uh, uh, the, the, that he knew, uh, you know, adults that, you know, were involved in the computer industry and uh, were programmers even. And, well, you know, I should maybe ask them. And uh, and and I did. And, um, basically, uh, you know, they, they were involved in mainframe programming and, uh, it, it was some assembly language mainframe programming. So I, on one hand, I wasn't that off far from the mark. Uh, but, uh, ultimately I didn't know the right questions to ask. So I didn't really get much from those conversations as far as filling in the gaps that, that I needed to fill in, you know, by, by asking the very vague, questions that I did, I kind of got answers that were more along the lines of, yeah, I'm not sure how it works on the Apple II. <laughs> so, but uh, I tried. I know in your book, you talk about um, playing games with your friend Mike when you were a kid. I mean, is that a strong childhood memory? Oh, absolutely. You know, we, we, we were playing games from as early as either of us can remember all the way uh, into high school. And 
I, I, I think, uh, you know, probably the one that stands out the most to both of us is when we were playing Ultima five, we lived in different cities at that point, you know, maybe 20 minute car ride away. So we'd still see each other periodically, but you know, we'd like be daily playing Ultima five and would, um, talk on the phone while doing it. And, and so we would tie up our parents' phone lines for just hours and hours at a time, uh, <laughs> playing this game. <laughs> and, uh, that, that, that was a lot of fun. Uh, those, those were the days. What were your earliest memories of going online and connecting with other users? Was, you know, was that mind blowing? Was that, did that feel like the future at the time? It was a whole new world. And, and, and it was one that really kind of captured my attention away from programming. When, when I, uh, did that tile engine on the 386 PC and saw that the logic worked, but it was still too slow to be practical for an actual gaming experience. I didn't really know where to go from there uh, with with programming. So I, I, I really kind of uh, just sort of set it down for a while. And, and then one day my grand, dad brought home a modem and <laughs> a whole new world opened up. I was calling ball and board <laughs> systems and eventually decided I wanted to run a bulletin board system and launched one called the data exchange and, uh, and, and, and then eventually added internet access to, to the bulletin board system that I was running. And I remember the moment when I was trying to get uh, internet access to integrate into my bulletin board system, which at this point what was happening in a context of I had never seen the internet anywhere because this is like 1994. So it mm-hmm. only existed in, in pretty much universities and, you know, uh, government institutions uh, at, at that point. But uh, I, I, I managed to, to get an internet uh, connection from one of the, uh, the first uh, commercial internet providers that, that, that popped up in the, in the area and was going to integrate it into my bulletin board system. But I, I'd never actually seen the internet uh, at this point. I, I remember having a web browser open and uh, probably Netscape or something like that. And and at the bottom, like in the lower left, at least at, the, at that point, that's where the web browsers would kind of report the connection status. And when there's no internet connection, it would just say something like looking up something or other dot com, whatever address that you would put in, it would just like hang there. So that's what I would see as as I was fiddling with the configuration and testing it. And I'd see that, okay, that doesn't look right. Fiddle with the configuration, test it. Nope, still doesn't look right. It's just hanging at this looking up thing. And then uh, after uh, the nth round of fiddling, I remember the moment where I go back to the browser and all of a sudden that status message it started changing. It started getting active. It's like connecting to this, downloading that. It was giving, you know, like a, a X number of kilobits per second. And then I start to see gra- very gradually, because this is a slow modem, you know, mm-hmm. a graphical screen start to paint in the web browser. And I was just like, wow, this is amazing. And, uh, you know, at this point, you know, this wasn't so much the user side of it, but just the idea of, of the kind of content uh, that was able to be accessed was just was just blowing me away because at that point I'm compared the only comparable I had or was dialing up or over a modem to a, a bulletin board system which had you know ANSI graphics I believe it was called ANSI so like text characters uh, used to create you know uh, s- some kind of a uh, you know graphical like shape and experience and uh, uh, e- even the early you know, internet web browser accessible graphics in 1994 were, were light years ahead of, of where BBS ANSI graphics were. So that that's probably the thing I remember the most. Well, Mark, I mean, obviously here, I mean, you know, we, we, we kind of feel like, you know, the Apple II is a bit of a distant memory for you now. I mean, you're running, you know, your unsuccessful business. Let's skip forward a bit then to, you kind of touched on it before, in the mid-2010s then, I know around 2014, you rediscovered the world of the Apple II. How did that happen then? How did you fall back into it? Yeah, so um, basically, I I moved. I moved uh, and uh, I moved somewhere that I had more space. And one of the things that had been in the, kind of in the back of my mind, I guess, probably for a while, was the the idea that well, you know, it would be fun to, to buy an old Apple II on eBay and play some old games. But I didn't have room for it. And then when I moved in 2014, 
uh, suddenly it was like, oh, well, that, that was one of the benefits to me of moving to this particular place. Like, oh, I'll have room for an Apple II. So I, I followed through on that, bought the Apple II on eBay and played uh, Ultima and Castle Wolfenstein and a bunch of other old games and, uh, you know, called up Mike, uh, Mike Reimer, my friend from the past. And, you know, he joined in on, on the fun as well. And, you know, we had a great time with that. And that was the very first stage of, uh, of getting back into it was, was just doing that. And, and eventually that led, you know, that basically woke up the, the, uh, all of the other stuff from the past too, about making games and, you know, where I left off with Apple II programming and et cetera. Well, you know, when you jump back into the Apple II then, I mean, did you find much of a, an active community online, you know, of users still interested in the system? And, and was that surprising to see that so many people were still into it and making things for it? Well, at first, uh, I, I didn't really know that anybody was still into it. I, I just bought this Apple II on eBay and for all, for all I knew, you know, people were selling them and, you know, museums were buying them and, and then, and then me, you know, I, I didn't really have any sense of like, okay, are there like other people that are really, you know, doing this. And, uh, so, so, and, and that really w- remained the case when, when I started writing, uh, Knox or Chaos, you know, it, 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 it and got together with, with, with Mike on, I mean, we, we really didn't know if anybody was going to play it, you know, this was this just going to be a thing that, you know, that we did. And, uh, and then a few months go by and in the process of doing research for various things related to the game development, I discovered, oh, hey, there's, there's, there's Apple II, uh, forums that people post messages in. There's people still talking about this stuff. <laughs> and, and, and yeah, it, it was kind of stunning, you know, cause I, I didn't, you know, had no idea. And, and at that point, you know, Mike and I kind of look at, look at each other. And we're like, there might be tens of people who actually play our game. <laughs> <laughs> we were so excited. And, you know, and at that point, the vision of what we were going to do was pretty small as far as, uh, you know, we were just going to write some free thing and, you know, have fun with, you know, a couple dozen people. Uh, we had no idea that where it was going to end up would be a, a game that sold over 4,000 copies that, was endorsed by the likes of uh, Steve Wozniak and Richard Garriott. I mean, we, if you had told us that at the beginning, we would have been like, what? <laughs> what are you talking about? There's no way that could possibly happen. So, yeah, it was definitely a, a, a process, especially early on, of, you know, just mind-blowing, my, 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 uh, exceeding of expectations as far as what was going on out there. I mean, it, it, it didn't take long. And, and, and seeing how many people were interested. And I was like, wow, if I had any idea that there was this much interest that was still there, which is, of course, microscopic compared to the, the audience for modern games. But nonetheless, but any idea of the amount of interest that was still there in uh, the Apple II and other 8-bit computers, I probably would have, you know, done a, a project like this 10 years ago. You know, <laughs> I mean, it just, I mean, yeah, occasionally I, 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 I thought a little bit about you know, games and writing games, things like that. But, you know, I, I just assumed that, that, that everybody had moved on and, you know, there would be, you know, no, no point in making something like that unless I was just going to do it for myself. And, and even though in the end that happened, it took a long time, you know, and, and getting an Apple II just to play games for that kind of nostalgia to, to, to kick in. So, so yeah, it was, it was definitely a, a shock to find. <laughs> So tell us about the game. What what's the story behind the game, and how did you pitch it to Mike? And you know how 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 did he get involved? Well, the uh, the story really developed over time. Mm. Uh, the the philosophy that uh, we, we we took was to to build the game engine first, make it as robust as possible, and then tell the best story that we could using that game engine. Uh, and and that that is a Game design philosophy uh, coined by uh, none other than Richard Garriott, <laughs> which at that time I had just I had just read about. You know that was that was before I ever talked to him, and thought you know this this makes a lot of sense. Let's do that. So um, we, we 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 focused on the game engine, and, uh, and and then eventually when it came to writing the story, um, you know I just had a pile of notes of ideas that I had written down over the course of time. Uh, that uh, it's basically somehow kind of had to get mashed into a comprehensible story. 
And uh, doing that, a, a, a big tool in doing that was reading a book on how to write screenplays. And that was something recommended to me by one of the uh, the project advisors that I recruited at one point, uh, Beth Daggers. Um, she was in the uh, the gaming industry from the the 90s to the 2000s and uh, worked for companies like uh, Lucas Gaming, worked on the Star Wars games and you know, really, really had a, an awesome gaming career. And uh, so, uh, you know, she, she was gracious enough to provide a lot of advice along the way and suggested when it came to the story to read this book on writing screenplays, because even though the medium is different, there's a lot of very similar concepts as far as, you know, story beats and uh, whatnot that, uh, that are similar. And uh, so uh, I did that. I read that book and, and then basically kind of went back to the pile of notes and, uh, trimmed away, you know, probably 90% of what was in the notes to focus in on, you know, the 10% uh, that that would fit, you know, kind of the classical construction of a story as as explained by this, you know, this book on screenplays. And, and, and then from there, translating that back to quest objectives and items and things like that, that was a whole process. And before really diving into creating a significant amount of content of the game before beyond, you know, basically just kind of like a demo, you know, to, uh, to, to, to test out all the different game engine features. I mean, I had a roadmap of, 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 of the story and the quests and the, you know, the key items and things like that. Uh, is so, so that, uh, the, uh, creating the content became largely a shovel ready project, uh, at that point, uh, rather than, you know, sort of a, a, a floundering uh, adventure of you know not knowing where exactly I'm going and redoing things and just uh, you know uh, that 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 kind of that kind of situation, which is exactly where I, I was afraid I was going to end up, uh, and 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 because of that, very much embraced the guidance from Beth and uh, and, and creating all that structure uh, to uh, to be able to guide the way. Uh, well, the, the name's interesting as well. Um... Nox Archaeus. Where did the name come from? Well, the the uh, the name is something that Mike and I brainstormed uh, very early on. Uh, one, what we we didn't name the project until we uh, announced it publicly, which was about six months after the start. And uh, once we announced it publicly, we're like, okay, now it needs a name. And we essentially uh, just brainstormed a bunch of interesting sounding words. And it was really more Mike than me coming up with the words. He's really good at coming up with different kind of words uh, that, that relate to a concept. And, you know, he like traces them into, you know, Norse origins and various, you know, mythological origins and getting Latin involved. And he's, he's, he's got a kind of a method to it that I don't, I don't, I don't fully, fully grasp, but uh, you know, it's like whenever I would need a name for something in the game, like, okay, there's going to be a death Knight boss. Uh, can you come up with, you know, some names and he, He'd ask some questions about, you know, the character and then just come up with this list of stuff. And I still don't know exactly how he does it. But uh, with with uh, the game name, uh, so he comes up with one of these lists of interesting sounding words. And uh, uh, we, the, 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 the word Nox and Archaeus were just names on this list. Uh, I, I think we picked out Archaeus first. Mm. And but it was like a process of elimination. There was a point where we had it down to, I don't know, like five of them and eventually whittled, whittled it down to... Uh, just like archaic because well that's the study of old things is what it essentially means and we're like well, okay well that sounds very flexible in the context of uh you know making a sword and sorcery role-playing game there's going to be some old stuff involved there's going to be wizards of oh, okay we can work with that and then nox the latin word for uh night uh or or dark you know it's like okay so we've got you know, dark and old things and all right. Yeah. That, that pretty much any story we can come up with can somehow fit with that in some way. Uh, so, so that's, that's how we came up with the name and actually in the book, uh, that, that we just released making Nox or chaos, uh, it actually talks in detail, uh, about that process and includes the text messages in like an appendix that Mike and I were sending back and forth when coming up with the name. And, uh, but that's, but that's how we came up with it. And, and then, of course, eventually we had to decide, like, okay, well, what is Nox Archaeus? Is that the name of the final boss? Is that the name of uh, the cult? There was a cult involved in, uh, you, know, you know, the game that was a, was a big protagonist, or is it something else entirely? What were the biggest challenges you faced when you were programming the game? 
Um, well, th there were a lot of challenges with the, uh, I mean, if we're talking the project uh, as a whole, there's a lot of challenges, programming only being one of them, but it, but specifically within programming, I, I think probably the biggest challenge was, th there's two that come to mind. One was dealing with intermittent bugs, and the other was uh, getting the game to be stable on floppy disk. Early on in, in, in the project, we ended up deciding to write some custom code for, for accessing the floppy drive that, that was going to make it a whole lot faster. Uh, this, this is like writing our own disk controller would, would, would be the term. And there was a disk controller that was written by Steve Wozniak in 1979 that was what was used in, uh, in, in the games in the 80s. And uh, a teammate uh, joined us uh, named Peter Ferry, also known as Cucumba, who had the capability to write a disk controller that uh, was optimized to, to, to run something like seven or eight times as fast as the, uh, the one that was used in the 80s, as well as do some other r really cool stuff. And he, he, he's, he's a, Peter's a grand master assembly language programmer. So was able to, uh, you know, look essentially look at what Waz did and make it better, and and which is, in and of, I mean is just an astounding thing uh, on its face, and uh, so so we went ahead and, and and integrated that into the game, and by having new disk controller code, well, okay, we had to test it, and uh, we tested it on hard drive, we tested it on floppy, and it took a long time, but we eventually got it working on both, or so we thought. And uh, it turned out that there were some lurking problems with, with the floppy support that weren't detectable initially because they would only happen after a couple hours of gameplay. We didn't, mm. we didn't have a couple hours of gameplay for a long time because we were focusing on building the engine and building the demo. And, you know, and then when it came time to, you know, to write the content, the content kind of got written in, you know, one long sprint. and. Uh, you know, so so we really didn't have enough of the game done before we got to you know really a late testing period to have been able to discover that there were still some remaining uh, issues, which in part had to do with there was a bunch of different models of floppy drives back in the day, and uh, it required you know some 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 different kind of uh, timing mechanics uh, to to properly access the drive. Uh, for for various different models and 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 that really uh, really threw things off because the kind of code we're talking about here this is code that is tell literally telling the drive arm in the floppy drive to move along the the surface of the disk and where to stop and when to start reading and when to start writing R really low level really 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 <laughs> yeah. low level so timing is key uh, for you know, you, you tell that drive arm to start move, you got to have your code go run in a delay loop, uh, knowing how fast the th drive arm physically moves so that you don't start having your code reading bytes off of the, the drive head until the arm is in the correct place, or otherwise you're just going to get garbage. It will fail silently, you know, uh, at, th at that point by giving you garbage. And, and these slight timing differences uh, between the different drive models had to be taken into consideration. And, and so this, 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 this was the kind of sensitivity that was going on. And, and we, we, we basically, we worked through a lot of that, but then we find out in this late stage that, oh, gee, there's still some issues. And, uh, you know, at this point, uh, you know, we had a target date uh, for release that was, you know, maybe like four months away, something like that. Uh, you know, we had uh, turned up two groups of beta testers that were, actively going uh going at the game working out bugs and things like that we and and they were on the hard drive version uh of the game behind the scenes you know managing the beta tester group but behind the scenes i'm working uh with peter on these late stage floppy issues that they were coming up and, and 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 working on a fix for that and uh, uh we were up against our our shipment date and uh still didn't have a full resolution on them in, in part because, you know, each fix that, you know, he came up with, well, that had to be tested and that took time. And so we ended up ultimately doing like a split release of the game 
where uh, we, we, we'd had a Kickstarter somewhere in, in this whole process. And, and so uh, for people who backed the Kickstarter and had, and had pre-ordered the game, we said uh, for, it, for, for, for digital, it, you know, was, 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 you know, easy because we could release an update. But for those that had basically backed for the physical box set, which came with physical five and a quarter inch floppy disks, uh, we said, okay, we gave them two options. We said, well, you know, uh, we, we can ship them to you now knowing that the floppy version has issues and it's a, and it's a beta. And, and, and if you're comfortable down the road, downloading disc images and transferring them to the floppies, you know, you're, you're, you, you, you can do that. Or option number two is basically wait on to receive shipments of the box sets until we have this figured out. And, you know, that could be months. It could be years. We, we really don't know because these were really, really, really nasty issues. And uh, so people made their decisions on that. There were some, you know, kind of in uh, each group. And, uh, uh, you know, and, and in the meantime, you know, I'm working, working with, uh, with, with, with Peter on uh, uh, reporting to him the results of the, you know, the testing and he's making more tweaks and, and things like that. You know, we were making some progress and, and, and I had recruited a special group of uh, floppy testers that included uh lane roth of uh it software fame he he volunteered uh, to help uh when, he, when we heard we were, were having some issues and uh he he had uh, experience uh you know writing code on the metal on the apple II back in the day so exactly the kind of eyes we wanted to have on uh you know looking at uh you know when there were problems you know look at what floppy plates were doing and other diagnostics and things like that and so, so we really had a good, 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 good team working on this and, uh, you know, felt like we were making progress. And then the, the absolute nightmare scenario happened where, uh, a couple of, uh, the testers, they had, uh, uh, repaired some floppy drives that were, uh, that they, you know, had in, in their collection that, that were, were, were dead. Uh, and they repaired them because they had those skills. And they would run every piece of Apple II software that they had without any problems, except for Knox or Chaos. It would crash running Knox or Chaos. And this okay. was like the, the last remaining, what seemed to be the last remaining problems for trying to figure out, okay, well, why are these crashes happening? And um, one, of the, one of the folks that did this, you know, these, these are, you know, really knowledgeable hardware guys, gets out an oscilloscope and he run, uh, hooks up an oscilloscope and, and looks at the wave patterns and is able to determine that the floppy drive is only mostly good. <laughs> it's uh, it's got some you know the, some of the waves are out of the specifications for the floppy drives, and and that's not right. Um, but it doesn't cause problems with any Apple II software except Knox or Chaos. And Knox or Chaos did a lot of ways, you know, we, we were trying to really push the hardware to its limits, you know, pick up where the 80s developers left off, stand on their shoulders and try to see, well, how much further can we go? And, and the floppy uh, controller code was, was an example of that. And so we saw a situation emerge of like, okay, these drives that are only mostly good are good enough for the way code was written in the 80s, um, but is, is 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 not good enough when it's pushed you know just a little bit further and 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 then and, and then it crops of problems and and this included like disk utilities disk utilities like locksmith and you know copy two plus you know that would like run a, a check on on the drive and the disk were reporting hey everything's fine well and those were written to 80 specifications but but i what i was seeing was this nightmare scenario emerge like okay so we theoretically have within the entire population of floppy drives uh, that, that are out there amongst, you know, Apple II computer users, uh, which, which, you know, there's, there's thousands of people that are still doing stuff with Apple IIs and, and have you know, physical drives that amongst that population, there's some percentage of them, which hypothetically are these drives that are only mostly good and therefore are going to have a problem with Knox or Chaos, but not with anything else, including uh, utility programs to, you know, to run these checks. And, and the people that have them, therefore, are, they're not even going to know that they have them. They're just going to get Knox or Chaos and it's going to crash. <laughs> so, 
And I'm thinking like, okay, so how do we get ourselves out of this one? Um, you know, especially in a context of, it's not like we can just say, sorry, can't do floppy support because we had accepted tens of thousands of dollars of money from Kickstarter mm -hmm. and pre-orders and things at this point. And, uh, you know, basically saw, you know, our reputation going up in smoke, uh, you know, in, in the process. And, uh, uh, at, at this point, what ended up happening was, uh, time, some time went by, you know, there were a lot of activities that were going on and that, 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 that I was, you know, focusing on. And this, this was just kind of, this was the biggest problem, but it wasn't the only, the only issue and some time kind of percolated. And what I was noticing was that the floppy tester group, uh, the only people that were reporting this problem were the two people that had rebuilt drives, taken drives that were completely bad and fixed them into, you know, the state that was, you know, now, you know, mostly good. The, there, there was nobody else that was reporting a problem like this. And again, the theory being well, the, the, the nightmare scenario is based on a theory that there is a amount of mostly good drives out there. And, uh, you know, we had maybe a couple dozen people in this group and I'm thinking like, well, you know, this isn't a huge data sample, but nobody else reported. I wonder if this mostly good state was a state that was the result of a, and no criticism intended to the wonderful, you know, testers that were, were working on this, but was maybe this mostly good state, the result of a, uh, a, a, essentially a, a faulty repair job that, yeah. that, uh, you know, essentially that you, you could only get maybe a mostly good drive, uh, if you started with a bad drive and tried to fix it and, and, and didn't quite get it fixed all the way. And it may have, and, and I thought, and it may also have nothing to do with the techniques that people were using. It may just be that some of the components on the drive, uh, itself were beyond, you know, repair. Uh, and, uh, that, that weren't obvious or something. Uh, but, uh, I thought maybe it has something to do with that rather than with, you know, sort of the average floppy drive that, uh, from the eighties that has survived that still works. Um, and that was kind of the theory that I started to develop and really, uh, ended up having to, uh, to take a leap of faith at one point because, there was really no way to test the theory. You know, we could, we could only, you know, practically get the testing, you know, the t we, there's no way to get the testing group large enough to, to really statistically be able to, uh, to prove or disprove the theory. And, and at one point, I, I basically just decided, you know what? I, I think this is quite likely what's going on. And absent any better, you know, theories or options, which there weren't, I made the call. We're going to bank on this. We're going to go for it. And, uh, what at that point was the final beta of the floppy version. Uh, we decided that to, to promote that to production and, and we put that on all the floppy disks that went out to all the backers who had said, wait to send me the game and, uh, you know, the physical copy of the game until it's all done. Uh, we just, we went for it. We sent it all out and hoped <laughs> and, <laughs> crossed and, everything crossed everything and, and and as it turned out we ended up you know the, the the number of bugs that that got reported on the game at all were very few and and the number of bugs that were reported on on floppy disk were 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 basically zero and i and i think i described this in the book as something like in some ways programming a game like this on the apple II is like playing a game of poker and this 40 year old hardware, you know, tried a massive bluff on us. And, uh, <laughs> and in the end, we called the bluff <laughs> and won. <laughs> well, it sounds like you had a really good team, you know, advising you and working with you on this, Mark. I mean, obviously, with, you know, Ultima being such an inspiration. I've got to ask about Richard Garriott then. I mean, how did you reach out to him and what advice did he give you? Sure. Yeah. Ab absolutely. Uh, so the, um, over the over the course of the project, uh, I, I'm I'm an avid uh, networker. Uh, I, I've done that a lot in my my professional career, which is which is actually in business and finance, not in uh, uh, IT, ironically. 
And, uh, and I've had some formal training, networking and things like that. So it's something that I, I, I always have an eye towards. And throughout the project, I always kind of, uh, you know, was anxious to meet people and, you know, took note of uh, other people that they knew and things like that. And uh, so when uh, uh, we were ready to, to, to launch our second Kickstarter uh, campaign, and uh, I, I, I was, was hoping to, uh, to get permission from Richard to, uh, for, uh, to, to be able to have Lord British appear in the game, uh, I knew exactly who to ask for an introduction. And uh, my, my, one of my uh, teammates, uh, Jared uh, Califf, who is quite known in the, the retro community himself, uh, was able to, uh, to, to help me out with that. And, uh, Richard graciously gave permission to, uh, to include, uh, Lord British. And, you know, we've, uh, we've had a number of, uh, conversations, uh, you know, since then, various things, often, oftentimes relating to, uh, your players' attempts to kill Lord British in the game. <laughs> we, we, we've had some fun chats about that. And, uh, I sent him the, uh, the Discord printout, printout's probably the wrong word, uh, of uh, with the, the first attempt that happened in beta testing, somebody tried to kill uh, Lord British and even hacked the game, you know, to, to try to do so, which of course would make it illegitimate even, you know, if he succeeded. But even with hacking the yeah. game, uh, was, was, was not able to kill Lord British. And, but he was like posting in the Knox Arcade's Discord play by play of everything that he was doing. And uh, so, so I sent that over to Richard, and he, he got a good laugh uh, out of that. And uh, and and then uh, in December, for the one year anniversary, realized that oh hey wow the game's been out a year, and you know nobody has successfully killed Lord British for an entire year, which is a first for you know every other game that Lord British appears in. There, there's 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 always been a way that people have figured out to be able to do it. And yeah, so yeah. to go a year without that, you know, that's remarkable. So I reached out to, to, to Richard and pitched him the idea. It's like, well, hey, what if we made a, a, a T-shirt that uh, said uh, uh, Lord British undefeated, you know, with like a blown up version of the Knox Arcaeus pixel art of, uh, of Lord British and, uh, and then some Knox Arcaeus uh, branding uh, on, on the back or something and, uh, to make it kind of like, you know, a joint thing. And he was like, yeah, that's a great idea. <laughs> and so we did that. And I sent him one, so he, you might see him sometime. You know, he, he's uh, uh, running around occasionally with uh, his Knox or Chaos uh, Lord British Undefeated T-shirt. <laughs> Brilliant. And um, how did you get your endorsement by Steve Wozniak? And, you know, what did he think of a new game coming out on the Apple II? Yeah, yeah. So that that's um, uh, was definitely was, you know, thrilled for that to happen. I mean, get, you know, getting an Apple II game endorsed by Steve Wozniak, of course, is like, you know, getting an endorsement from the Pope, pretty much. Mm. Uh, that, that, that was just like incredible for, for us to have that happen. And, uh, you know, that came about as well uh, as a result of, of, uh, of networking. And uh, it was a, uh, it was, this was a third degree uh, networking feat. I, I remembered that uh, one, one of the, uh, the Kansas Fests, that that I had been to, and that 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 is uh, an Apple II computer convention held every year that uh, in Kansas City, Missouri, and it's been going on since the '80s, and they got the name Kansas Fest as a result. And so, but since the '80s, this has been going on, including you know to uh, to present day. And and I remember that in uh, I think it was 2019 or 2018, one one of those one of those last years it was held in person before COVID, uh, that Roger Wagner was the keynote speaker. And uh, Roger was uh, a avid uh, columnist in uh, the Soft Talk magazine, one of the publications of the day. Uh, he wrote a column called Assembly Lines, and he was the developer of uh, the, uh, the, the the Assembler Merlin, uh, created software on the Mac called HyperCard. You know, he's done some pretty awesome stuff. And uh, so he came as a keynote speaker that year. And I remember him showing in his slideshow some pictures of him, Steve Wozniak, Steve Jobs, and uh, a couple other. Uh, you know, the, the early Apple uh, employees and early computer uh, folks from back in the day, like on some beach somewhere, you know, they were pretty good friends. I basically, I pitched to Chris the idea of him asking Roger uh, to, to ask Steve Wozniak <laughs> if he'd be willing uh, to talk to us so, the, so then we could pitch him on appearing as, a, as an NPC uh, in the game. And uh, uh, so, so that all just kind of went click, click, click. Chris was like, sure. Roger was like, sure. 
And Steve Wozniak was like, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, it couldn't have gone better. And uh, so, so we got permission to put him in the game. Uh, and, and then, and, 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 and he, you know, even get him to, uh, to tweet out something about his, uh, his appearance in the game. It was it's something like, uh, you know, there's, uh, I, I, I appear as an NPC game. Uh, I appear as an NPC in a new game for the Apple II computer that I invented 40 years ago called Knox or Cast or something like that. I'm like riding my exercise bike in the afternoon, you know, taking a break from, you know, all the game release, uh, chaos uh and 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 drama that's going on in uh, discord and every other media channel and uh uh all of a sudden my phone like starts exploding with you know notifications uh you know from twitter and uh i'm like what that's uh, that's okay what's going on here and and then i'm getting like this bomb of text messages I hear those alerts going off and then it's ringing and, and I'm like okay i i got to i got to pick up the phone and, and while it's Chris calling me, he's like, look at your email, look at your email. <laughs> and I, so I'm like, okay. And, and I'm still riding the bike at this point. And uh, cause, yeah, I was like, trying try to, you know, get that done so I can, you know, get back to uh, managing stuff with the game launch. Open the email, click the link that Chris sent me on Twitter and see the tweet from Steve Wozniak, you know, endorsing Knox or Cast. And I just about fell off the exercise bike. When that <laughs> <happened>. <laughs> Well, I mean, obviously you can't get much of a, you know, bigger endorsement than was um, supporting an Apple II game. So that's incredible. I mean, Mark, if people want to read more about him, and you have got a book out as well, The uh, Making of Nox Archaeus. Now, I'll link up your website, 6502workshop.com. Um, people can get the physical editions of the game there as well. And that's available on Steam and modern platforms too. But if people want to get the Apple II version, you can get the physical releases from there as well. So uh, I'll put that all, that, all of that in our show notes as well. Just before we wrap up, I mean, are there any plans to uh, do anything more on the Apple II then? Do you think you'll do another game at some point yeah I, I think it's likely the, the the timing is a little bit uh unknown at this point uh but uh, i think uh you know there there will likely be an expansion in pack for the original nox or chaos game uh there will likely at some point be a sequel uh written on the apple II, but also playable on modern platforms like steam and good old games and and there may even be a, like a remastered version of nox or chaos at some point that has uh, more modern, you know, still, you know, kind of top down 2D tile, but more modern graphics, more modern uh, sound and music, uh, you know, probably most support auto mappers, you know, quality of life, stuff like that. Uh, mm. That That's also, I think, another likely project. And uh, coincidentally, to, uh, uh, to, to be able to help, uh, you know, dedicate the time uh, to get some of this going, uh, I'm likely going to be launching a Patreon uh, in the next couple of months as well. Wonderful. Well, uh, 6502workshop.com, obviously all your social links and everything are on there as well if people want to keep up to date with uh, with where you're at with it. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you, Mark, and uh, well done for you and the team. You know, keeping the Apple II scene alive, it's always nice to hear people making new projects for classic systems. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. Thanks so much for having me. It's been, uh, been a lot of fun talking to you guys.